Hi folks. So, uh, occasionally when I'm teaching, uh, I get asked about uh, warded padlocks, or warded locks in general. Um, and people either ask about them where it's that master lock with that funny squiggly keyway, or uh, that lock with a key like this, or even sometimes a lock with a key like this. Um, and so, again, I was, uh, doing some errands at, uh, a local big box store, and they had one of these, uh, Master Lock 500s, uh, on the rack, and it was cheap enough, and uh, I realized, uh, the last time I was teaching, I could not find the warded lock that I usually have in my kit. So, I thought, let's take a look at this. And actually, when I was going through some of my old videos recently, I realized that I hadn't actually done a video on these. I thought I had, but I hadn't. Um, so if you notice, all of the cuts on this key are just these very square, or fairly square. Some of them are a little bit uh, rounded out. But uh, they are all of more or less uniform width, very square. So, obviously, not a pin tumbler lock, because you need those sloped sides to the cuts in order to push the, uh, the pins out of the way, so that the key can go in and out. In this case, all we have to do, we've got this uh, rotating disc in the front. Let's uh, get a tool out. I can show you. This is just going to spin freely. This is just a floating disc to make sure that the key is the right uh, profile for the lock. So we're just going to slide that in, stick it in all the way until it stops. This is a tip-stopped key. That means the tip of the key hits something in the back of the lock and stops it from going in any further. And then you just turn, and somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees, the lock is just going to pop open. Turn it about 90 degrees, and it will stick. And the lock pops open. And if you notice, this has a slightly different uh, set of cuts than we're used to. This has a notch here and a notch here. And that's because what's actually happening, uh, and you might just be able to see it, that little black bit. Uh, I picked a point. Right here is actually part of a spring. And what happens is when you insert the key and turn it, the tip of this key is going to push these two springs apart. Let's uh, see if we can actually see that happening. Do you see that bit moving? Very slightly. Those actually normally clamp down into that cutout. Uh, and that's what releases the shackle and allows it to pop out. But these are incredibly simple mechanisms. Basically, each of these metal plates either has a perfectly circular cutout where the key goes, or it has a, uh, a narrower cutout that... Uh, the, the plate has to fit into these notches cut in the key. That's what stops just any of these keys from working any of these locks. But this uh, mechanism goes back to at least ancient Rome, really, uh, where they had uh, sliding locks, where they had a... they would usually fashion them into rings or necklaces, that would have this sort of pattern, and it would have to fit in and then slide over to release the bolt. We've just gotten a little bit more modern about uh, how we actually manufacture them. So picking tools for these have been around for ages. Uh, you can They're called uh, warded picks. Uh, it's essentially a very similar 
design to what modern handcuffs use. Um, and there's a whole variety of them. This is a skeleton key that I made or a warded pick for uh, the smallest version of the master lock uh, warded locks because I could not find a commercially manufactured version that fit. But basically, they're just going to follow a fairly standard pattern like this. So usually what you do is you start with either the smallest or the largest one of these. And if you get the older ones with a key like this, you're going to use this tool. But for this, we know that it's a double-sided key like this. So we're going to just concentrate on these four. And so we'll start with the smallest one. Just insert it there and turn, wiggle it around a little bit. We're going to sort of just feel whether or not we are uh, hitting those springs at all. We sort of are, but we're not pushing them far enough apart. Okay, so this one's too small. So we're going to pick the wider one. Do the same thing and feel around there, see if we're hitting those springs. And we're not quite doing it right. Okay, so let's try the ones with the double tips. Start again with the small one. And let's see if we can get it to turn. And that does it. So basically, you just walk your way through these. Sometimes you'll find that uh, these uh, double post keys uh, or warded picks won't fit, uh, which is why in my kit I keep both. This is the Southward warded pick set, and then I also have the Peterson warded pick set, which is a little bit thinner uh, and is mounted on with this uh, Chicago screw. Um, so I keep both in my kit just because that way I will always have something that will fit. And if my explanation of, so these are, well, they're really honestly just very terrible locks. Uh, these are fine for locking up, like the one really good thing about these locks, or two really good things about these locks are one, they are very, very cheap. And two, uh, they will take a lot of abuse and a lot of wear and a lot of rust before they stop working. So uh, if you have just some something that you don't want people tampering with, uh, and this lock needs to hang out in the rain and the snow and the dirt and the sand and whatever weather you have wherever you are, uh, you know this this works. Just you know don't lock up anything valuable with it. These are very low tamper resistance, very durable. That's what they're for. Uh, and like I said, this mechanism has been around for a very long time. This is pretty much a similar design. This lock was probably manufactured somewhere around 1860. This is from a, uh, a roughly Civil War period uh, brownstone in Brooklyn, and basically this key just goes in, turns, and throws that deadbolt. Now Jason Meeks has uh, shown some of these, but I happen to be working on restoring a pile of these. So let's just give you a quick look at what's in there, because we've only gone for about nine minutes, and I think people can hold on a little bit longer. So we just take that screw out, and then very carefully we're going to remove this cover plate. And you can see inside, very simple mechanism. So this plate is basically flat. It's got these two protrusions, which are going to line up with the deadbolt and spring, and they're just there to uh, keep these from sliding out of place. And that's pretty much it for the cover.
So put that aside. Inside, this is the spring latch. This is the hub, the uh, knob, or the uh, spindle for the knob would go in here. And when you turn it, this hub turns and retracts the latch until it pops out of place because I don't have the cover on. Again, very simple, just a spring to push it out and this hub will turn to retract it. The deadbolt is slightly more complicated. This is uh, sometimes referred to as a single lever lock, but uh, basically he just goes in. Uh, this has a bit of a shoulder to it, which is stopped by the cover that I took off, but I can insert from this side and you can see any tool that is able that is thin enough to fit inside that case can fit in and turn and that's going to push that lever up out of the way and then push the bolt over and then that uh, lever is going to snap back down and then we can turn it back the other way lift that lever push the deadbolt back out of the way. And that's all there is to it. So I can even very carefully take that deadbolt out. Again, you can see very simple uh, piece of metal, not a ton of machining required. And then the lever, similarly, very simple. It's got a hole here to fit on a uh, pivot that is molded into the case has this flat uh, steel spring to push it down uh, against the deadbolt. This bit right here is the stump, and that's what uh, makes the uh, deadbolt a deadbolt, because when it snaps down over this protrusion, the deadbolt cannot retract at all, and it's not being held directly by a spring unlike the latch where the only thing holding it out is the spring up here. And this just moves up and down. And then you have this protrusion right here, which acts as a stop for this lever and also moves in this slot to guide the deadbolt. And these things pretty much will not die like the only thing that happens to these is that spring will eventually break after like 80 or 100 years, or this deadbolt, if it's been put under a lot of strain, uh, will crack somewhere where the metal is relatively thin. And repairing these, as long as uh, these major cast components are in fairly good shape, these will keep going for ages and ages, and the only thing that you'll have to do to get them back up and running is replace these springs and give them a bit of a cleaning with some uh, light oil. And that's about it. So, until next time, folks, have fun and happy picking.